Team Hulse and PRB have limped into Rio. They are no longer racing in this leg, but they are in a new personal and critical race to Newport, as the team are moving heaven and earth to rejoin the competition with a new mast before the next leg. Welcome to the Ocean Race Show with now news official that Team Holson and PRB have retired from this leg. And we are joined with skipper Kevin Escoffier. Now, Kevin, you are safely on the shore. You're, you're in the hotel in Rio, not where you want to be, of course. Um, first of all, let, let me just ask you about the decision to retire before we get on to how it is you're going to uh, get yourself back on the water. Why retire? What, why was it that you realised okay, we're going to have to start thinking about the next leg. It's very simple. Uh, it was not possible to, to have the mast uh, here in uh, Rio um, in a timing that allowed us to be uh, in Newport on time. And uh, the only solution uh, we, we, we had was, was to fight to be at the start of the leg, uh, of the leg five. And uh, in order to do that, uh, the only solution was to get the mast in Newport and the boat in Newport uh, uh, each uh, part uh, on the on its uh, on its side. Right. Okay. So so then talk me through the plan as it in there because because I know that you guys have been looking at this. You've been pouring over every detail. Um, everything looks easy until you actually have to pick up the phone and try and organise all these things. The mast, the boat, Newport. How how is that coming together? Um, we've got a mast that will go um, via cargo ship to Newport, and the boat will go on another uh, cargo ship. To Newport as well. It's, uh, it was the only solution, and uh, we will try to do everything in order to to have a boat in good shape uh, at the start of the leg five. But it depends. It's not finished yet because we need uh, our boat, Holcim PRB, to be on the cargo ship. The the boat is arriving tomorrow, tomorrow evening, and in order to be able to be at the start, we'll have to put to lift the boat uh, on the cargo ship on the cradle. Uh, hopefully, we had our containers. Uh, still in Itajaí with the cradles, and we will put the cradles on the cargo ship and lift uh, the Imoca Holcim PRB on the cradles in order to be delivered in uh, in Newport. I can see, I can see the rush. I can, I can completely understand. <laughs> you know, there's not boats every single day. There's a lot of things that you need to do here. You need to get the cradle. You need to put it up, and just pulling in a mocker, even with the mast down, pulling in a mocker out of the water, it's not easy. How stressed are you at the moment? How stressful is this? Is this kind of rush? Yeah, it's it's a rush. Um, again, uh, I think the stress will come down as soon as the, the cargo ship will leave uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, with the boat. A part of the stress, and the other one uh, will uh, we, will go down when the boat will be back in the water with the mast uh, on the on the twenty or twenty first in the morning. I don't care to be able to take the start in Newport. Uh, for the leg five. With Team Holson PRB now officially retired from the leg, our four remaining boats are heading north, tightly packed together on the way to Newport. 11th hour racing team were in the front row sailing strong, but to their east team militia were holding their own. Just 30 miles behind, the other two boats were also paired together. Bio term to the east following the Germans' line, with Guyo Environment Team Europe to the west working hard, dragging their heavy gear around the deck trying to find the right way to balance the boat. There is some stuff on the bow because it's a very light wind. So we try to equilibrate as better as possible the boat. So now there is a little bit more wind. So we bring back all the bag uh, at the middle of the boat. But wind ward, of course. How many times per day do you do that? Uh, three, four times per day. But it's always me. I say, oh, I think uh, we need to stack again, leeward, windward, at the bow, backward. <laughs> I like to do that. Seb may say that, but nobody likes hauling gear around the boat. But what they do like is going fast and keeping the boat at the perfect trim and heel each time the wind changes is what's required to find your best speed. 
And the way that the race course has been laid out with this wind direction means that the focus is on that level of intensity. Those small searches for tiny areas that might be hiding, a little secret adjustment and then unlocking the boat speed. The boats have been going upwind pretty much from the start and we haven't seen too many maneuvers. It's all been about straight line speed. Those few tacks that they've done have been critical, but they just haven't been many. So how important was it to get those tacks right and what is involved in tacking in a mocker? Well, I want to get technical here for a minute because Team Militia gave us a chance to unpack that manoeuvre, the upwind tack. What is it like taking in a mocker from one tack to the other? How much work have you got to do and how crucial is it to follow the steps in the right order? The first thing that all of our teams do when they're tacking is to remember not to throw away all the settings they've got on this side. They might have spent hours getting the sail shape just right by using the perfect amount of sheet tension. It's always worth taking a look at how the sail is set up and copy all of that onto the other side to continue sailing at top speed. For example, Team Militia here, their J0 sail has been trimmed with a very flat foot or bottom edge. Great for going upwind in flat water and they will need to do the same again on the other side. Next, Nico is lowering the new rudder into the water, winching it into place while easing the uphaul line with the other hand. He's also got the windward foil extended and set up, ready to be used after the tack. It's easier to do it now when it's out of the water and free. He's saving energy and time. He's joined by Will, who's just been moving the gear down below onto the new side. Now they can start ticking off the checklist, just like pilots before a takeoff. Yeah. Uh, foil's down, nice. Yes. Thank you. Rosie and Chris join them in the cockpit as Will loads and preps the new sheet for the head sail. You guys want a furl or just blow it through? Furl now. I can show you. A furl tack agreed, so the furling line is the last one to prepare. Furl on a uh, port inside winch. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Paul said they're going to be using the port inside winch for the furling. They've got four winches on this boat, but they've only got one pedestal, one set of handles. How are they going to be furling the sail and trimming it on on the new side with only one pedestal? How does the power know where to go? Well, a lot of you have been asking us to explain exactly how the gearing system works and how the sailors can direct their power to the right winch. So before we go on to this maneuver, we have to find the answer. Yo. So we only have one pedestal that controls four winches. So we have this system here that you can see. If I want to connect to that winch, this is engaged now. If I want to wind some main on in this main case, on. main on, here we go. I disconnect this winch. So now if I spin it, nothing is working. And I connect this winch, maybe main on. Same deal for the back. And if I want to get more runner on, Find some runner on the back of the boat, engaging here. Now the power get transmitted into the winch. There we go. But with one, we can actually do quite a lot. So the pedestal's ready, the winches are engaged, and now Will can turn the boat through the tack. Okay, tack in the boat. Nico Lundvin eases the old J0 headsail sheet to help turn the boat through the tack while the whine of the hydraulic pump tells us that they've started to swing the keel over to the other side. Now the physical work really begins. Rosie and Chris turning the handles first to furl the J0 part way so it clears the force of the J2 and can go to the new side. Furling now complete, Chris strips the winch as Rosie engages onto the sheet winch and deploys the sail. They have a few precious seconds where the load is minimal and they race to pull in as much as possible before the wind fills the sails and the going gets heavy. Can I give you a uh, okay. There is now so much load that Will offers to turn the boat back into the wind, making the final few meters of pulling easier for Rosie and Chris, but potentially at the cost of speed. With the sail now in, Will turns the boat back down to the correct course, the sail fills and the power comes on.
plenty of hard work and lots of important jobs that must be done in the right order. But we won't be seeing another tack for a while. The wind direction allowing each boat to point direct to Newport. As our four teams pushed on, the conditions even allowing 11th Hour Racing Team to enjoy a calm night, one of their first for many months. Very good these nights. Unfortunately, with the indoor sailing, we don't have enough of them anymore. You have to wait for a nice light day. Of and, which uh, there are very few. Of which there are few. <laughs> <laughs> so I think now more than ever, we have to appreciate them when we can. I'm with you there. But it's pretty cool. While the nights for 11th hour racing team were spent stargazing, Guyu Environment Team Europe was watching some very different lights shining out of the darkness. We can't control, we are in a big wind with some clouds, so it's really hard for us. We are a falling boat, really fast boat, it's really hard for us, so can you please turn a little bit uh, east, north, east, just to help us. Thank you, have a good night. A difficult night for the European team, but the wind stayed. And with daylight, all our boats were on a reach with the sea state flat enough for the boat speeds to increase to over 25 knots. Biotherm was still to the east of Guyo Environment Team Europe and were also enjoying the conditions. Their speed peaking in the high 20s as the foil could accelerate the boat without the waves to crash land into. We lost quite flat water. We're reaching 110 degrees to the wind in 20 to 23 knots of wind. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fun. Just ahead of them, Team Militia were also foiling. The building breeze was coming more from the east, freeing the boats, and the sailors could feel the sensation of flying once more. Um, good to be going fast. It's, uh, it's pretty full on conditions, if I'm honest. The wind is so up and down with every little small cloud that comes. So a lot of work today. Um, a lot of work last night. But yeah, nice to be going fast again. It's a happy different boat. <laughs> Are you happy with the speed of the boat? For now we're we're going okay. We've got a look we're we're working the speed out still, but yeah. I should say we're happy. But the boat that was really happy was Guyo Environment Team Europe. Just on the western edge of the pack, they found nearly two knots of extra speed at times. And leaving Biotern behind, they moved right up to 11th Hour Racing Team and Team Militia to contend for the lead. But then, disaster. Their foil downline, the rope that holds the weight of the boat when they are foiling, broke. They had no choice but to turn off the wind, slow right down and fix it, while the other three boats stretched ahead. Essaye de tirer vers le haut plutôt, je pense que c'est plus difficile. Mais pour sûr, je sais que c'est plus de problèmes que j'ai expliqué. It took hours to sort the issue, but there was no chance to shortcut the work. And when the team turned north again, they found themselves a hundred miles behind. A bitter blow for a team that just before was setting the pace. A tough time for Guyo Environment Team Europe, but there is something coming up very soon that could reshuffle the pack a little bit. The doldrums, that light wind area of the Atlantic is just ahead. Now we've seen what this area can do to the positions of the boat on leg two, but that was when they were going south and a little bit further to the east. Now we're going north and we're much further west. 
What are the doldrums going to be like this time? Well, somebody that has crossed the doldrums multiple times in both directions is previous ocean race skipper Sam Davies, Anamoka, round the world sailor as well. And she joins me now. Sam, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk us through what the doldrums are going to be like. So I guess the big question is, how quickly are the teams going to be able to feel the effects? It kind of starts early because off that northwest Brazilian coast, you've got some currents. Um, quite strong current Um, and in my experience it seems like that current tends to make these kind of squally cloudy things that you can't really see on any weather forecast and sometimes you don't even see them on the satellite photos Um, so you might actually see the boats slowing down and doing weird things before they get to actually the theoretical doldrum zone Um, and so I think the the tricky stuff is real local stuff and sometimes not massive things that are easy to spot. It's worth checking out the, how the clouds are forming and dissipating um, as to whether you're going to get uh, wind or wind sucked away or, or big wind. And obviously radars on in the night um, because that's going to help you as well see, see the squalls. And yeah, for me, it's real local, local navigation around um, everything that's going to get thrown at them. So in terms of miles lost, you do have the opportunity to get those miles back as we get into the doldrums, but it's going to be those little bits of, well, cloud hopping. I mean, we, we, we talked about that on, on the way south. Um, the difference approaching the doldrums this time is we're not VMG running, you know, we're not zigzagging across the water. We're, we're in quite a procession sort of going in, reaching in. So you think it's going to be just get in there, bury yourself in there and just deal with the smaller scale stuff. That, that's where the action is going to be. That, that is the theory. And, and you were saying about uh, uh, the, in the doldrums, you know, they might be able to make up miles. Um, what we get taught when we do um, weather lessons with the meteorologists um, or sailing meteor or sailors who are navigators, they basically say, never try or never think that you're going to make up miles when you go through the doldrums. Your objective is to come out the other side without having lost any miles. Um, so that's the the kind of the mental approach that you've got to have is that okay, this is a this is a hurdle and an obstacle to get across, um, and this is, it isn't here where we're going to make our big gains. This is just you just try and sail smartly across and come out the other side where you were when you went in, rather than you know going down a big snake and uh, and, and losing a lot of miles. As always, wise words from Sam Davies and our sailors in this edition know only too well how important it is to play not only the tactical game through the doldrums, but the mental one as well. And time will tell what Robert Stanjic and Benjamin Dutroux and the rest of the sailors on board Guyo Environment Team Europe can do as the fleet slows down just ahead of them. And also, the clock is ticking for Kevin Escoffier and the team on board Team Holson PRB. Can they get that boat to the start line for the next leg in Newport, Rhode Island? We'll have to wait and see.
Tiptoe. 